Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brainwaves. Uh, today on Brainwaves, we feature an interview with Dr. Kafui Tirasa, MD, PhD. He's an assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral science and also a member of the House staff at Duke University School of Medicine. Uh, Kaf has also won uh, an Imro Janssen 2013 Rising Star Translational Research Award uh, for a brilliant proposal. Uh, this proposal, if successful, will uh, enable us to better understand how the brain functions on a circuit level in healthy behavior and how it malfunctions in uh, disease, uh, state conditions of psychiatric disease, and uh, perhaps generate a new technology which can, can fix these malfunctions in circuit uh, at the circuit level, so um, uh, in a very original way. Uh, so, Kath, uh, thank you for being on Brainwaves today. Oh, absolutely! It's my pleasure, and thanks for having me. Uh, definitely, absolutely, great, to, great to have you. So, um, I, you know, I did a little research on you. I hope you don't mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Google's a, a, a invasion of privacy, but uh, it enables me to find out a little more. I can talk to you about it. Uh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> So I noticed on uh, the STEM CP website's 2011 profile of you that there's a quote that you live by. It's, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and I really like that principle. Um, it, it's helped me to accept the facts of my life, my condition, my work, and to, to work with them more effectively. What does that principle mean to you, and, and how do you apply it in your work to better understand and treat uh, mental illness? Yeah, I think so much in life is a balance, and I'll probably start sounding like a psychiatrist here. <laughs> but I think it's this challenge of accepting reality, knowing that you can't change the past. And for me, it's even interesting as a neuroscientist, understanding that you can't even change the present. And what I mean by that is, as a neuroscientist, just thinking about how human beings operate with everything we experience, whether it's our senses, touch, taste, smell, it's this idea that we perceive things after they've happened. So even our reality of the present is the past. So, you know, I think we spend a lot of time in life um, trying to rewrite the past, thinking about how to change things that we have no control over, and that energy is wasted when we can better position ourselves to ultimately to try to change the future. And so I think you have to have the starting principle of saying, it is what it is, life has given you what it's given you, and then you apply all of your energy to making tomorrow different. That's great. That's great. And so, so you're now applying a lot of energy toward uh, understanding the brain and, and how to uh, and how it malfunctions and how how to treat treat uh, psychiatric disease, which I really admire. Thank you for doing that. Um, to be specific, uh, concerning your rising star proposal, uh, can you provide us with a little background? Uh, a fact that you start with is that when uh, our brains are functioning, uh, when the different parts of our brains work together in concert to to create healthy behavior. Um, we can actually see that their electrical rhythms are in sync with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, can you please explain a bit how this synchrony enables this healthy functioning? Yeah. So, and it's, it's one of these sort of classic ways of thinking about the brain. And I'm an engineer by background, so much of my framework and my thinking comes from that. But if you were to think about the brain, you could sort of thinking about it originally as a hodgepodge of chemicals, which, you know, people have thought about it in that way in the past. But ultimately what it is, it's like a super mega computer. And you have, just like a computer, you have different parts that are doing different things. You have memory, you have a hard drive, you have a central processing unit. And our ability to ultimately get something or extract some utility out of that computer is based on all of those parts working together. So each of those parts performs essentially a unique function, but the function of the entire computer together depends on those parts working together. And so a computer has a clocking system where it can tell the exact timing at which things are happening. And you can, you can imagine the challenge you would have if your CPU is saying something at the wrong time when the hard drive isn't working or it isn't ready for it or the memory. All of this has to be synchronized in time. So ultimately, our brain works very much the same way. You know, if you were to distill it down and to think about something maybe simpler than mental illness, something like a movement disorder. And so it's something as simple as your arms moving or you reaching out for a cup of coffee and holding your hand steady. There are parts of your brain that deal with that. There's a motor cortex. But there are other parts that deal with keeping the movement tracking steady, coordinating your eyes, thinking about objects where they are in space. And so there's your basal ganglia, there's, there's your cerebellum, there are all these parts 
that interact together in each of these millisecond periods for you to be able to do your movement. And what, the, as an engineer, this is what we think of as a distributed system. So the system that's necessary to do things is in different parts of your brain. These different parts of your brain are linked together. And they're linked together with the signals moving so fast between different parts of your brain that these networks responsible for behavior ultimately lie in widely distributed or areas separated in space. And so the challenge is that that's probably the reality with mental illness as well. When you think about a simple behavior, you take a disorder, whether it's Alzheimer's or autism or depression, and in these periods where people have this profound social isolation, similar to what's seen in schizophrenia as well, the, the brain parts that are necessary for one to socially interact are probably just as complex. There's a part of your brain dealing with the rewarding value of interacting with somebody. There's memory that's giving you sort of context to faces. There's your ability to see the faces and see them appropriately. There's linking, all of these pieces linked together to give you a representation of what this conversation, this communication, this experience is. And so in mental illness, it, it, there's no doubt that either one of those different areas or processes could go wrong and still lead to the same behavioral manifestation and the same behavioral process, which is one being unable to appropriately interact in terms of social behavior. And so our challenge is to begin to change this language of the brain and change the language of how we think of mental illness so that it's no longer these broad stroke disease categories, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder. These disorders are ultimately probably 50 to 100 different disorders each that we classify in one way because of behavior. But if we can understand these neural circuits or these neural networks responsible for normal behavior, how those same neural networks can become dysfunctional or disconnected in the context of illness, then we can begin to come up with tools to address that. So people have begun to study these um, brain rhythms or brain patterns using different techniques to understand how the brain processes the information and how these areas that are separated in time and space basically come together to produce behavior. And this has been come, it's a, it's a term that's now gaining some sort of uh, vogue in the field, which is functional connectivity. So connectivity is how one brain area projects to another one, or so how there's these physical links between them. Functional connectivity is how information is grouped across these different brain activities during behaviors. And you can see changes in functional connectivity that happen across all of these behavioral domains that we see in neuropsychiatric illness. Okay, so... Uh, like I said, that's, that's brilliant <laughs> that you're addressing it this way, that you're looking at the functional connectivity um, in a means to hopefully better diagnose a, a psychiatric disease in addition to treat it. Um, so how will you figure out the precise patterns by which our brain regions sync up their electrical rhythms uh, to create healthy behavior or don't properly sync up in diseased brains? Yeah. And how do you hope what you discover might well, you kind of covered this, maybe you can expand on it. How, how do you hope it might actually change the way we diagnose mental illness? Yeah, so the, the first challenge is, is sort of a big challenge. It's, it's how we understand how brain areas sync up. So what you ultimately want to do if you want to understand these behaviors is study these things in a species that can give you really great feedback, tell you exactly what it's thinking as it's behaving. So this would be a human being. The challenge is we don't have tools available that allow us to see the signals at the speed that they're happening in humans, it, which is what the issue is called temporal resolution. So we don't have tools that give us the temporal resolution in human and the spatial resolution. In other words, we see them at the, at the microscopic level at which these signals are being processed. So we can't get all of that in humans currently. So the tools that we use in, in our lab are in vivo neurophysiological recordings. And the idea is we implant electrodes directly into the brains of animals, giving us both the spatial and temporal resolution. Now, that's classically not done in humans, and so we use mouse models. And the beauty of the mouse models is that mice can be, man they can be manipulated to express human genes which give risk for illness. So by doing this, we can understand how these genes which give risk for illness in humans ultimately change the way these neural networks work. So we're able to monitor brain activity through these electrodes that have been implanted, and this gives us the firing of individual cells with millisecond resolution as it's happening. We get dynamic brain activity. These are the EEGs that you classically see in humans when the scalp electrodes are placed in their heads. We get these from the tips of individual wires, and those are called local field potentials. And we're able to get those across 14 brain areas concurrently in a mouse as it's awake and behaving 
and performing behavioral tasks similar to or designed to model areas of disease domain dis behavioral dysfunction that you see in humans. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, uh, so w once you study these mice using this this te uh, these technological tools, um, you, you you may see how their their brains are malfunctioning, and and, and what the circuit changes are that, that cause the malfunctioning. But uh, you also propose to maybe fix the these malfunctions using a technology which you call closed loop actuators, which you're basically inventing. Um, how how what what are these? How do they work? Yeah, so the idea is that when we see this dysfunction that occurs in an animal, um, like the networks that I had mentioned before, it's multiple brain areas that are syncing together, synchronizing together to produce behavior. So the challenge is when we look at our animals, we find what are essentially lesions in functional activity in these genetic models. But that only tells us that they're lesions of functional activity. It doesn't actually tell us that these lesions are actually responsible for the animal being unable to do those behaviors. So it becomes a biomarker of illness, but it doesn't actually tell us this is exactly the reason why this animal can't do the behavior. So the actuator answers two questions for us. The first question is, if we can then fix a specific functional lesion and repair the behavior in the animal, from a scientific standpoint, it's fascinating because it tells us that this is the change that may be contributing to the animal's behavior. So it goes from just being a simple biomarker to actually being a target for therapeutic development. Hmm. The second thing is, as we're developing these actuators, if they actually work, it gives us a tool that can be translated into humans. So we do this in two steps. First, we find these basically groups or collections of functional lesions in our genetic models. And those become the biomarkers that we can then just test with the actuator that we're creating. And the goal of the actuator is if you have two brain areas that can't communicate, um, you could imagine a landline, a telephone conversation, and there are two people on the landline, One's talking, the other one's hearing, um, and there's context, right? So depending on what one person is saying, the other person is interacting, and there's communication back and forth. So the challenge becomes with neuropsychiatric illness, and part of the hypothesis we're working with is there's something goes wrong with the line line. And so now maybe there's static, maybe there's some other problem that pre prevents the information from getting through correctly. And so what our actuator is, it's a cell phone. <laughs> So the cell phone now allows us to get information from the person A, process that, and then tell person B what person A is saying. And so we approach that the same way in the brain. If we can combine these technologies, and this is the approach that we're taking. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's I think right. that something right in the background. I'm just going to turn it off. <laughs> so if we can pull the information out of the brain using this approach and where these functional lesions are, but basically before the roadblock, process it using an external computer, figure out what that signal is saying, how the second part or the person B is supposed to be interpreting that signal or brain area B, we then send that information back into the brain around the roadblock. The challenge is, is most of these circuits that we're dealing with communicate with each other on the order of 30 milliseconds. So 30 30 milliseconds, so one one thousandth of a second, 30 times that. And so we have to have systems that do this very, very, very quickly. Folks have begun to develop systems like this to deal with people with motor dysfunction, with spinal cord injuries, with paralysis, and we want to adapt these for use in mental illness. So as a proof of principle, these things, that these devices have been developed in humans for motor illnesses and neurological illnesses, we want to expand on that. That's incredible. Would somebody have to wear like a, a box or, a, I mean, I'm sure the technology will develop as time goes on and, and work is put into it, but uh, I guess it would involve in, implanting um, some, some componentry in their, in their heads and then, and then governing it with a sort of a pacemaker sort of like device. Uh, thing. Yeah, so the, the idea and, yeah. and sort of our, our definition of these, our, the way we describe these actuators are pacemakers for the brain. And okay. it's exactly the principle that's used in the heart. It's these, these, these pacemakers which actually can detect abnormal rhythms, process them, and suppress them in real time in sort of the same fashion with the repeat and putting information back in with this principle that if you can correct electrophysiological timing, you can actually get the circuit to work correctly. Wow. And so in, in the short term, it would look like probably a larger pacemaker which has some wires that go into the brain and may have some sort of box device that's 
you know, book bag or something else that's stored in, in some compartment of the body, much like the deep brain simulators now, ultimately we perceive that these chips could probably get small enough that they would just be implantable microchips that go directly into the brain. And wow. as the technology evolves, you know, whether it's 15 or 20 years from now, the goal would, to be ha would be to have these chips basically using energy in the same way that the body uses energy, such that it wouldn't need an external battery supply. Wow, yeah. That, I can see how that would be possible to do. There's some, some developments that I, I'm aware of that, are, that feed off, like, I guess, body heat or electrical potential or motion, things like that. Yeah. Exactly. So it boggles the mind what can be done. That's, that's really yes. cool. Yes. Um, so what sort of conditions do you think this technology might be able to, to address? Yeah, I, I think that the illnesses that will probably be targeted first would be those with periods of intermittent sickness that have periods where people are, their brains return to normal behavioral function in between. So these would be illnesses like depression and bipolar disorder, where the periods of really mood states that are really high or really low, but then there are these periods of normal behavior initially. And these may be initial target point because there's already deep brain stimulation that works for some subsets of patients. Um, electroconvulsive therapy has been shown effective for decades in some of these disorders as well. So the actuators would be thought of as a tuning or optimizing of those stimulation-based techniques. Down the line, um, disorders like schizophrenia or autism, which have more of a neurodevelopmental component, would be sort of the next target for actuators, where it may require us targeting multiple circuits simultaneously in order to restore behavioral function. Okay. And so I think that's how it will evolve over time. Okay. Wow. Um, that, that sounds like you got your work cut out for you, but, but <laughs> a, good, a good prognosis for helping people uh, in, 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 in time. So, yeah. um, so thanks for telling us all about that, Kath, and uh, thanks for appearing on Brainwaves. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So uh, if people have any questions for you online after I post this video, are you ready to answer some questions? Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. All right. Thank you, Kath. So you have thank a great you. day. Thanks as well. Oh, th thank you. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll talk soon, okay? Look forward to chatting with you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.